Hey, what's up everybody? It's Lids, and we're back for some more Gwent, and today we're playing the new Plus One Seasonal Event, which is an alternate game mode in which whenever we play a unit, we will also spawn a one power copy of that unit in the same row. And today we are playing a deck that has a bunch of cards that got huge buffs from the most recent patch, and it was already a deck that works really well in this event. So let's go give it a look. So today we'll be playing a Nilfgaard Imprisonment Cultist deck that just got a bunch of huge buffs from the most recent patch, which is pretty crazy because it was already pretty strong, at least in some seasonal events, and this is definitely no exception. So the big idea is that we're going to be building around the Eternal Eclipse new scenario, but uh, before we dive into the details here, let's just start by saying that what we want to do is have as many cultists in our deck as possible because we're going to gain power whenever we play a cultist. That means that initially what we want to do is play cards like the Eternal Eclipse Deacon, which just got a provision buff down to four provisions, which is amazing. And so you start with these guys, ideally, to create more cultists in your hand and in your deck. You want to make sure that you have at least two gold cultists in hand. If you already have that, then you can start to turn some of your bronze cards into cultists. And then once they're on the board, you can use the order ability to get more cultists in your deck. And because in plus one, you'll create one power copies of these guys, that means you'll have two of them on the board, so you can create two more cultists in your deck, so the number of cultists that you can get scales rapidly. Then, we're going to play the scenario, the Eternal Eclipse, and we'll spawn in an Eternal Eclipse Initiate, which is another one of the cultists we have in our starting deck. These guys, which, uh, well, they can infuse our opponents with a damaging ability, and whenever we play a cultist, they take that damage. If we destroy that card, we create a copy of it on our side of the board, and humongous buff especially in this event it used to be that that was always a one power copy of that card now it's a copy of that card that gets powered up based on how many cultists you have on your side of the board and especially in this event where we're creating one power copies of all of our cards we're going to have a ridiculous number of cultists so that uh, boost is going to be ginormous or at least certainly can be so that's big we'll get one of them from the scenario and then once we play our first gold cultist we will then infuse all the cultists in our deck battlefield and hand with the ability to get powered up by one every time we play a cultist and if we play a bronze cultist then the number goes up from a plus one boost to a plus two boost so on and so forth so the more cultists the better and then if we play a second gold cultist technically not strictly necessary but it gives us another eternal eclipse deacon which means we can create more cultists and we're playing a cultist with that deacon and so that means that we're triggering that boost on all the cards that we just infused with that ability to get boosted when we play a cultist so again basically the more cultists the better so you try to get the deacons early if possible to get for yourself even more cultists uh because once you trigger this chapter one that's when it determines who's going to get that power to get boosted up whenever you play a cultist so in terms of what else we have, it's obviously those starting bronze cultists. We also have the Master Ceremonies, which will randomly make two gold cards that are not usually cultists in our starting deck turn into cultists. So that gives us easier ways to trigger our scenario and also gives us three damage on the uh, one of our opponent's infused abilities. And so as long as we have three cultists at the time, that's a way to more easily proc the Death Wish. On those cards that we use the initiate infusibility on and in terms of what the other golds are we have yennefer illusionist which is just amazing in this event because we're obviously going to be spawning in cards every turn and so really easy damage and probably going to be a fairly easy death blow as well and so uh she'll technically be able to get powered up not super quickly but that's uh, also a factor so big card there for us we have emir who will give our opponents spying, and uh, we do have some spying synergies we'll see later on in the deck, and he's obviously just a gold as well. So that is another card that we can potentially use to trigger our scenario. We have Letho, and Letho is a little bit complicated because since he transforms, that means that he will lose any status that he already had, so do not focus on infusing him. He will lose the infusion uh, if you do go that route, because what you do is instead you transform into a cultist with Letho, Ideally, you choose a, a bronze cultist, and that way you're procking the, the boost on all the cultists that you already have. So he's a finisher, really, for that reason. Then, to here, get boosted when your opponent uh, gets boosts, and since there are a lot of greedy decks in this event, he's sort of a counter in that way. Godric to fine-tune our hand, especially when combined with Snowdrop, gives us card draw and boost on Snowdrop. 
for some consistency. Prophet is one of the other starting gold cultists that we can have in our deck, and so that's one way to guarantee that you can proc your scenario and lock one of your opponent's cards. It's technically not great in this event because you're only going to get that deployability to trigger from one of the Prophets, not the one that spawns in at one power, and your opponent is going to get that first card that they play uh, locked, but the one that spawns in with one power will not be locked. So again, it's basically just here, so we have another way to more reliably proc our scenario. Then we have Thirsty Dame, which between our infusions from the Initiates and the spying from Emir has a decent amount of ways to get a fair number of boosts on her. Then we also have a few more spying synergies with the Manganel, dealing damage whenever our opponent gains spying, and the Turncoat, which can deal damage to spying units, which might also be a way to weaken up the cards that have the Initiate Infuse ability on them so that you can more easily trigger that Death Wish. And then we have some special cards just because you tend to start to run out of space toward the end of the rounds in this event. So Spores to reset a unit again because there's generally a lot of boosting in this event, so that's a nice way to counter that. And if you can manage to weaken one of your opponent's cards because we do have a fair bit of damage, then you can use Amnesty to steal one of them. And outside of that, we also have Teleportation. The reason why we have this is because we can use it to replay one of our cultists, and in doing so, proc the boosts on all of our other cultists. Granted, I tried doing this in a match, and it didn't always work, so it feels like it should. This might be a bug, because Teleportation did technically get a rework from the most recent patch, but it didn't seem as though it was something that was going to mess with this combo, so... Let me know if you guys do try this out, how effective it is, because in theory, it gives you another way to proc even more boosts on all of your cultists at the end of a round, which should be a great finisher, but maybe not quite as effective as I had initially thought it might be. But there's a look at the deck, and like I said, it is all about creating as many cultists as possible and getting both damage and boosts in the process. So let's go see it in action. All right, so going up against Northern Realms here, and it will go first. Okay, so let's see. We have some cultists. Only one gold cultist at the moment, although we could create another with the Eternal Eclipse Deacon. We do not have our scenario. We could get another cultist with a Royal Decree if necessary. So let's try swapping out. We do have some spying synergies. Manganel might actually be better than the Turncoat when we already have Emir. Well, I mean, both of them, of course, are solid with Emir. Let's maybe... Dump Amnesty. Onir can get a certain area. Okay, so this, in that case, looks much better. And maybe we dump Spores. Okay, so it's Spellweaver Spam. I think we can pretty much say that much for certain. And I think what we might be looking to do here in that case is, well, I mean, we can, of course, use Leader Building to lock some of these guys up, and that might be worth doing because they will otherwise be able to deal two damage immediately here, so they'll shut down the spawned-in copy of whatever unit we play, but if we go scenario turn one, then uh, that might even be the play. Okay, and for what it's worth, the Dovrik was the other card that started off with the uh, additional cultist tag. So let's use Onero to get our scenario. So, as of right now, this guy is safe. However, the two damage from here, plus they may very well have a spell or two in their hand for damage, might go down to that. I think we're willing to live with that if that does happen. Obviously, the earlier we shut these down, the better, but this could be a solid target. Or dam Oh, also, yeah, obviously they're going to get more charges when they play more uh, more mages. So, yeah, we, we should probably just lock these guys immediately. So... Can do that, and then what we're going to want to do is trigger this chapter one pretty much as quickly as possible, because that's where most of our points are coming from. So we would like to have more cultists in our deck before doing so, however, so that's where the deacon could come in. So I think what we'll do is we will use the deacon here, and we could either make one of the gold units in our hand another cultist, so we can trigger chapter two as well, or we can just rely on our Royal Decree to get a second Gold Cultist. So, either way, really. I think... Let's go... 
There. And yes, let's lock these guys. I think it's worth it. As we just saw, they're going to be able to scale their damage really quickly. Probably still not going to be the first spell weavers we see. But it is likely that we'll have them uh, see them build their entire deck around these guys. Okay, Letitia is going to power up these guys more quickly. They might use this first charge immediately. A little surprised to see the hmm. leader ability charges there. But uh, And for what it's worth, just thinking about our previous turn... Might have preferred to have made a gold cultist in our hand because then we could have used Royal Decree to create or play another deacon from our deck. And that's uh it's pretty sweet when we're creating multiple additional cultists every time we play one of these guys. Usually you wanna make your bronzes uh cultists because they scale more directly or they scale more rapidly. But Snowdrop is nice to have a cultist because we already have uh, the cultist tag on... Oh, we have not yet played a card. Right. Um, well, why don't we trigger our scenario now, which we can do with either Yennefer or... Yeah, well, likely Yennefer. And so she's going to deal damage every time we spawn in a unit. And we are going to spawn in units every turn, which makes her a pretty sweet addition. But yeah, we're getting multiple additional cultists every time we play an Eternal Eclipse Deacon. So it is perhaps preferable to prioritize just making as many of these as possible before you trigger that chapter one. Okay, Gerhardt. Another mage, of course, and curious to see how they use this order ability. Because at least some of those will be coming out immediately, and they're trying to replay those Spellweavers. Don't succeed this time. I mean, they're trying to probably get that exact Spellweaver back. But they do not. They have a bunch of other bronze mages in their deck. That's not terribly surprising, but that's how they're trying to build around those Spellweavers. It seems like they were relying pretty heavily on those first Spellweavers staying around and not getting shut down. So I think probably a good thing we did opt to use them. So now what we do is whenever we play Cultists, not only is every existing Cultist going to get boosted by one, they will also have the number that they get boosted by increase if it's a bronze Cultist, which is why creating... Bronze Cultist in particular is a really nice thing to do. So let's go with the Initiate here. And we'll see if we can target one of their relatively weak cards with this order ability. Deal additional damage with Yennefer. And this guy would like to shut down as quickly as possible here. Because they're trying to stack up his damage pretty quickly. And that is potentially... Going to be some resilience there on these guys, so we'd like to shut them down as well. And we could... Oh, technically, yeah, she was uh, she was going to give us extra damage if we had infused someone first, so it might have been worth, instead of playing Yennefer, I mean, the earlier we play her, the better, because we've already seen us get some damage from her usual ability, but we would have liked to have gotten the, uh, the three damage on an infused card, which we can do if we go that route. And I think that is what we will do here. Royal Decree, and I'm deliberately not using it on this guy just yet. Because when we do this, we're going to get the weakest infused card damage by three. And that means we're getting just the right amount of damage here. To take that guy out. We'll also get this Deacon out. And create some more cultists. I'm going to go with Emir. Just because that means that... Uh, we have already a lot of spy synergies. And I gave the cultists to the Maganil. So, you know, there's more reason to play all those cultists together now. So now with this guy, we're going to target, you know, one of their one power cards. Preferably something that's an engine. Like, probably this Eretuza student. And these... These guys recently got a pretty huge buff because it used to be that whatever card comes back over to your side when you destroy it after the infusion used to be that it just comes over as a one power cultist. Now it gets boosted by the number of cultists that you control and we control a lot of cultists. So that made the meditating mage pretty big. Who would have loved, of course, if we could have gotten the other one as well, but alas, 
Uh, I believe it, unfortunately, was the thing that got destroyed by Yennefer. So, I mean, for what it's worth, we can also teleport on this guy, because he does not have the infusion. So it's not a bad idea. In fact, may opt to go that route here. Let's uh just fine-tune her hand further if we can. Uh, that might not be a terrible idea, but let's go with you. And technically, ooh, okay, we should, technically should have done that first. And I'm not entirely sure who that's going to give the cultist tag to, because I waited too long. But, uh, I mean, just about everything at this point, as we just saw, is a cultist in our deck. So, lots and lots of ways to trigger the uh, infuse abilities here. They know that this heir to a student is very likely to get destroyed, so they are concerned. Understandably so. And this Thirsty Dame might not be a bad option. Or, you know, maybe we try to save all this cultist synergies, or rather the, uh, the spying synergies for round three. Letho, I believe we can have transform into one of our cultists here. Might even want it to be an Eternal Eclipse Initiate and just try to get as many rounds of this ability as possible. Because, uh, well... The thing is, I believe if we double down on this guy, we can actually hit him twice. Ooh, this is a cultist, and it is very tempting. In fact, I am going to stick with you. And this is also really tempting to get more of the uh, initiates, but let's go Letho, and let's transform into an initiate. Which means that it counts as a cultist, which means we get a lot of damage here. I think we're probably going to have to use this. We are not likely to get another Meditating Mage. They know they have to use this Order ability, otherwise we are getting this guy. Okay, Chapter of Wizards. I don't even remember what their most recent... Well, I mean, they're about to get a new most recent Mage, and it's an Adept. Still have some patience ticking here with the Eretuza students, and yeah, they had to give the boost to this Eretuza student as well, otherwise they risked... She would get uh, carried over, or we would steal her, basically. So, I mean, then again, we will destroy you when we play our next mage, or when we play our next cultist. We could potentially create four copies of you if we did even more here. We are still in the lead after they played a card, so we have card advantage, and we're in the lead, so we can force them to either go two cards down or have us win round one with one card to spare. So, as tempted as I am to keep on playing, because this is a lot of fun to stack as many of these cultists as possible, I think we probably do technically pass here. I wish we could just have this round go on forever, but alas, I don't think it makes much sense. They are going to get, oh, I was going to say they're going to get some carryover from this chapter of wizards, assuming that they were going to pass, but they are not. Donamir, just for a point slam, which is enough. And I think what we're going to see here is they're going to try to use... Those, uh, those big boosts, or the big power-up they got from the Meditating Mages, or not the Meditating Mages, the Vanard students and the Eretuza students to use some much stronger alumni. Okay, so now what we're looking to do is make sure we have as many cultists as possible. As I said, I think many of the units in our deck have now become cultists. We can get one more with Onero. Let's dump the turncoat because it's not a cultist. You obviously are. I think we get rid of you as well, and Kahir could certainly counter, if at least if they're trying to focus on their boosts. They will dry pass, so, I mean, if we had a throwaway, we could use it here. Granted, we didn't really have a throwaway. Uh, uh, yeah, it is kind of unfortunate, in truth. Probably should have anticipated that, but I forgot that, uh, well, that was a likely outcome. So might have wanted to keep that non-cultist uh, and a turncoat or something like that. I mean, could it even be Onero here? Just use that to get rid of something bad, like the non-cultist they had turncoat, perhaps? Obviously, we'd like to have Onero, but then again, our hand is pretty much as good as it's going to get here, so I'm not even sure what we would need to use Onero to tutor into. Because all this stuff is pretty sweet, so uh, I think it is Onero. And it is... I mean, do we have anything that can give us carryover? Not really. So yeah, basically just play our one non-cultist. Which, yeah, as it looks, definitely would have been our best throwaway here. But we are still on one card advantage going into round three. And with some big cards at that. 
Okay, so Snowdrop is a cultist. Would have liked to have paired her with Dodrick if possible, but we just didn't have enough tutors to have that happen in round one. Same um, Spores. I think Spores I like because it's Northern Realms. If they go uh, the boosting route with their alumni, then might want to be able to reset that. Not sure Same is really going to be a factor here. I mean, the more cultists, the better. So that's definitely a good pickup. I mean, other than that, another Deacon. A Bronze Cultist technically is slightly better because it would increase the number of boosts we get on all of our other cultists. But maybe we don't get too picky here. So let's see. If we're expecting alumni, they will have zeal on the, the alumni because they certainly got higher than four for both their Eratusa and Banard students, which means they can deal a lot of either damage or do a lot of boosts immediately with zeal. So that means whatever we play here is certainly at risk of getting destroyed like to get cultists down as early as possible though we'd like to get you down and build around you but that is perhaps something that for that reason we would like to not have get destroyed what if we go with an early prophet to shut down whatever they're hoping to play next and that just gives us a little more time to safely get a cultist down here Ideally, you'd usually like to play this guy just before that Adrenaline 2 is going to kick in, because it's presumably your opponent is saving one of their big cards for late on. But it just means that now, at least their initial card is getting locked here. It's also Prophet, given how their second card that spawns in is not going to get locked from the deployability. He's not as good in plus one as he would be in other events, but he's one of the only two cultists that we can, gold cultists that we can guarantee we can put in our starting deck. So for that reason, he is still here, basically just a proc. The cultist tag. Um, yeah. So now we can at least boost this guy. And he stayed on the board, which was not something we could guarantee without having played him first. So we would like to get initiates out here if possible, or Thirsty Dame and then initiate. Maybe we do this and see if we can get them to overreact to it. Okay, Rainer, that's actually not what I expected. I expected him to go more the damage route. That is going to be a source of boost, which means Kahir could be a big factor, and this is a card that I'm kind of deliberately not playing immediately because I'd rather not show them that there were, we actually want them to go the boosting route. I want them to uh, start doing some boosts, or at least set themselves up for boosts like with Raynard, and then throw down Kahir and be like, haha, not so fast. So... That is tempting. I think we might now go for the initiate or, well, we do have the, the Thirsty Dames down. So let's go Emir here. And that Deacon is actually very nice. And I think we prefer to this Master Ceremonies. Less in the way of direct points in terms of base power, but because it is a bronze cultist rather than a gold cultist, it will increase the boost that we receive on all of our other cultists, so for that reason, I think it is preferable. Okay. Yes, this is exactly what I want them to do. I want them to focus on more boosts. And now maybe we do drop Kahir. Okay, well, they're going to lock a couple of cards, so probably going to end up being here. It, technically, we already received some boost before they did it, but okay. I mean, that means these two will go unlocked, presumably, and so will Emir. So, I think at this point, we might be wanting to get the Initiate out here. Either that or we Snowdrop and see if we can fine-tune our hand even further, because at this point, I mean... Yeah, we might still see them boost further. I'm not sure if we're going to get a ton of value out of Spores. Might instead want something like Manganel that does synergize a little bit more with Emir. So, I think we still do this. Okay, we could steal something if we really wanted to. I think Thanid Turncoat, I mean, it does synergize with Emir. It is a cultist. 
think we do prioritize that. Bronze cultist at this point in time, pretty valuable to us. Pretty valuable to us when we have as many cultists on the board as we currently do. Okay, AA. We'd like for this to still stick around on one power so we can fairly easily destroy it with the initiates, but we shall see. They're gonna, should activate it very soon. But also this, yeah, these immortals are just gonna further power up the thirsty dames. Curious to see if they have any, uh, any reset ability, like we did play a bunch of big cards in this row. But uh, we are gonna play some other big ones in the melee row from now on, I would think. So let's, wanna get you down early. You're probably the last card we play. Both these technically have long-term value. Well, tell you what, we could use the turncoat to give spying to somebody and then steal them. Like Raynard. I think that's pretty tempting. I think that is pretty tempting. I mean, yeah, because they locked down our here, so there's no longer that much value we're getting from doing that. From uh, them boosting. So why not just take the boosting for ourselves? I'm curious if they have something like Yurden, though. Even if they do, we have at least one big finisher that it will be tough for them to answer. It is alumni, as we expected. They're going the, with the damage. I'm curious who they go after. Maybe one of these Thirsty Dames. Yeah, that makes some sense. That would suggest, though, that they might not have a Yurden. Otherwise, they wouldn't have needed to damage this row. But now... Okay, we will definitely play the Initiates. Just trying to see who we might want to damage because we could use the, the Turncoats to weaken this alumni. And, I mean, I guess it has already used its Order ability, right? So there's not necessarily any reason why we should prioritize sealing that over something else. So, then again, it actually is now one of their weakest bronzes. This is going to have the vitality, which complicates matters a little bit. So let's do this. I think it's still going to be sealable for us. Technically, I think we actually do want to go range row here. Otherwise, we might run out of a little bit of space. If we are trying to steal this guy. Oh, right. This one. Which, presumably, they're about to use the Order Billy on. If not, then we can uh, destroy it and seal it. But that will not be the case. A Caretaker can purify some statuses, yes. But just not really sure they're going to be able to put that to... That much use at this point when we have not yet used these order abilities. So yes, technically we've already won, but just want to show you what the plan was here. Do that. Do that. And okay, you can get the picture. We are going to create a couple more alumni there and then trigger the cultists using our uh, deacon at the very end. All right, so going up against Skellige here. And they'll go first. Okay, so we do have our scenario. That's obviously great. We have, uh, well, it's actually really unfortunate if we happen to get the uh, infused ability on Letho, because that means, or the starting infused ability on Letho, because that he's going to transform and lose his status. So that's a bit of a loss there. We can still transform him into a cultist as a finisher. That's why he's in the deck. But, uh, I mean, we have plenty of bronze cultists here. We do still have one gold cultist, and we create, or we can get our other one with Onero, which was Snowdrop. Okay. So we can still make that work. I'm not sure how helpful Spores is going to be in this round. And teleportation can help us replay some of our cultists, so I think we do prefer that. All right. Defender turn one. Melee row. What does that mean? Maybe Dogger? Because he is, of course, row locked in the melee row. They seem to be, I would assume, a discard deck since... Okay, well, we might be able to read into that a little bit. Scenario? Pirates? I mean, that's Battle Trance, though. I mean, it could be. It could be. Well, I mean, speaking of scenarios, we're probably about to lead off with ours. So, let us... I mean, either do that or we could go Deacon first just to create more cultists, but... Yeah, sure, we'll do this. We actually have 
mostly cultists in our hand here. So take your pick. I guess we'll go pick here. And we will create two more cultists in our deck with these order abilities. If these guys do stick around, hopefully they do. It's Melusine, okay. Fortunately, no zeal there, which means we do have enough time to make some more cultists in our deck. Generally, we prefer to create bronze cultists, assuming that we have enough gold cultists to trigger our scenario in the first place, because the bronze cultists actually scale the value of the boost that you receive whenever you play a subsequent cultist. So for that reason, I am deliberately focusing on those, because we should have enough gold cultists here between the Master Ceremonies and Kahir that we got uh, the Cultist Tag on previously, or Oniro into something else. So let's go with our scenario now. I'm going to deliberately row stack a bit here, because that means it's hopefully a little bit tougher for them to take out some of our Cultists altogether. Obviously, the rain may very well be able to destroy this Deacon, but we want as many Cultists to stick around as long as possible as we can, because they will start to scale with the boosts, and we did luck out there. We did luck out there. Now, granted, this initiate doesn't really have anyone to target when Covenant of Steel is down there, because it cannot hit uh, any golds, but they're running out of space in this row. So we could also, if we wanted to, replay this initiate with teleportation and get a second one out there. That's also an option. But what I actually think we would like to do here is go Onero and use this to get our other deacon, with which we can once again create more cultists, because the more cultists we have, the more opportunity we have to scale the boost for the rest of our deck. Basically, every unit becomes an engine. Okay, Freya's Blessing, they did discard some things. So yeah, this is the thing. Now their melee row is completely full. Well, granted, this one's going to get destroyed. It's not going to be quite full, but they're likely to uh, spawn, or likely to have to play things in their range row, and then we can use the initiate. So let's use this to once again create even more of the cultists. Again, trying to prioritize the bronzes. Now we, obviously, generally speaking, bronzes tend to be weaker than gold, so that's kind of the balancing act that you do have to weigh. But now we would like to trigger Chapter 1 because we have made as many cultists as we will realistically make unless we choose to go teleportation on this deacon. I think that's probably overkill at this point. We'd more likely prefer to do that on the initiate. So let's trigger all this stuff. Now every cultist that we have will get boosted by one whenever we play a cultist and uh, everything is a cultist now did play you guys in the melee row because we were starting to run out of space, but of course it does mean they technically have a little more potential now for uh, damage from the rain. So probably should have still gone range row with you. But, okay. Let's see. Now, still nothing in the range row for us to go after, unfortunately. They do have some stuff that will get boosted every turn, namely these priests. So, here is not a terrible option. He is a cultist, so we will boost these guys and get boosted whenever we play other cultists as well. So that's not a bad idea. We could, as we were saying before, use Letho to transform into one of our cultists, and that also can trigger the cultist. He will lose the infusion, unfortunately, so he's mostly there just as a finisher. But I think in that case, we might actually prefer to go Kahir now. He obviously is row locked to the melee row, so he'll have to be there. It'll also, because he was a gold cultist, spawn in another round of Deacon's Force, and at this point we have too many units for us to be focusing exclusively on one row. A Giga Scorpion will get rid of one of the Kahirs. That's not terribly surprising. This Kahir might get destroyed by the rain. It's possible. I mean, it wasn't crucially important, because they aren't doing that much in the way of boosting, but there's some. He does get hit. But he does survive because of the boost on those priests. So, I mean, once again, we can use this to create even more of the cultists. And there is one card 
one card in our deck that is not a cultist, and it's Doedric. So that's what I mean. That is what we get from prioritizing the Deacons. So now we're still trying to find some bronze unit that we can go after, but they've yet to play anything over there. So I think we could create even more Kahirs if we really wanted to. That is an option. He's not going to be a cultist. Uh, we, that's why I would usually prefer to transform into another cultist. But, yeah, may choose to go that route and probably will go a bronze cultist at that because that will proc the, uh, that will increase the value of these abilities. So I think we do probably choose to do that. We'll go the initiate. I know it doesn't yet have anything to, uh, to target with the order ability, but as we were just saying, the deacons have basically nothing left to use their abilities on. They'll pass. They'll get some boosts. They'll deal some damage, but we are still in the lead here. And so, for that reason, we can pass now and win on even. And we have a bunch of cultists in our deck that will either get stronger when we play more cultists or will, at the very least, trigger those boosts when we play them. So, love that. Okay, well, we did draw into our one non-cultist. That is Dodrick. He does, of course, help us get other cards, but I think we might swap out of him here. We could swap out of Teleportation, but it is actually a really nice option for us. Royal Decree, definitely good. Uh, teleportation basically means we can replay a uh, copy of one of these initiates. So when we play it, we spawn in an extra copy. So you replay that copy at the end of the round, and in doing so, that's one more opportunity to boost all of your cultists, which is pretty sweet. So we might opt to keep this, and we might even go for a 2-0 here. I mean, we could, of course, could, of course, force them to go a card down if we were to dry pass. But I'm thinking, let's see, they're probably going to try to get these melee scenes out from their graveyard, I imagine, which is decent carryover. We, they might have wanted round one to go a little bit longer to further increase their base power, but if we can force them into doing that in round two rather than round three, that might be a nice thing to do. So I think we might opt to do that here. In which case, we should probably start with things like... Hmm, actually kind of want to start with our, our gold cultists. And then we, later on in the round, use the bronzes to scale those boosts. So, might go Emir first here. I think we will. And Manganel does synergize with him, but I think we'll still get rid of it. Okay, Onero into what? Yeah, we knew they are going to either have Scenario or Mushy Truffle, because we saw they had a... Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce... The, the Sorceress Lady who presets Scenarios slash Locations. Okay. So they're going to try to boost these up as quickly as possible. But... We could, of course, block them with our leader ability and or, really or, use the initiate to try to destroy one of them and create one on our side. Don't want to lock and go after one of them with the initiate because if we lock them, then the uh, the infusion does not work anymore. Could also go Yennefer Illusionist and in doing so, destroy this weaker powered one. That would, of course, naturally be the easiest target for us to go after. But I think given how they have Mushy Truffle here, they're likely to boost these guys if we don't immediately destroy one of them. So let's go this route, I think. Okay, and well, they have another. And there is the Golden Froth. See so yeah, that's gonna make them fairly big. What it's worth, we do have... Oh no, Spores is organic. I was gonna say, do we have an Alchemy card in deck we could potentially use to make these guys more powerful if we do manage to steal one. Not quite. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we could have also locked the, the one here, but I think now what we'll do is maybe we'll do Initiate. What are we going to get with Onero and Royal Decree, though? Hold on. Potentially Snowdrop. Actually, Snowdrop, ooh, gives us the extra damage on an Infuse card. So we would like to get Initiate down there first to do the Infusion and then play Snowdrop. That's probably still the order of operations. Destroy one of the preachers and 
I mean, Yennefer will help us get a lot more damage here. I just... We have enough damage potential that I'm hesitant to use imprisonment here because we might be able to destroy both of them or the one that they're about to spawn in, certainly. Yeah, unless they use Martyr Room, that's understandable. So if we can destroy multiple of these, that would be fantastic. So we're... Let's see if we... We should probably place no drop here. That's going to give us three damage. Plus one damage from one of these. We can actually we can double down on the infusion on you and create two Crow Clan creatures if we really wanted to, but probably prefer to try to destroy multiple with the infusions. Also, we can steal one of them if it has spying with Emir if it drops down to one power, but don't really want to steal one that has the infusion because that's a wasted opportunity. I think we still do this, though. And then... I mean, we could play our other initiate, true. But I think now is the right time to do Snowdrop. She gets destroyed. That preacher, that is. And I do like those options there. Not going to use the Snowdrop ability just because we don't really have enough time to, to make it happen. Obviously, it would be nice to boost these two up and make it a little harder for them to get removed. It's for Kusia. This is going to be to get the melee scenes back. We anticipated that they were going to do this. And we were trying to force it out. And, oh no, for Crow Clan Preacher, really? Okay. Little surprise there. Little surprise. Maybe they thought it was pretty urgent to try to prevent us from triggering this infusion. But I hate to break it to you. We do have more ways to trigger it. And by that I mean we have more ways to get more of them. And now let's do this. I still don't think we're likely to choose any of these cards here. Even if this Thanid Turncoat is a cultist. And at this point, it's probably pretty safe to lock some of these creatures. We're not really going to be going after you. Probably will go after you and you, though. I think we lock you. The other ones, theoretically may still be possible for us to destroy and or steal. Okay, Small Blood Priest. And that triggers their last round of their scenario. So now, we can infuse more stuffs. And, I mean, the easiest target is to go after uh, Small Blood Priest or a Crow. That's very easy to trigger that. Which... May want to consider, at this point, now we don't have as much damage remaining. So, that's, you know, maybe we will go that route. Get you, and get you, and then we can, if we'd like to, either teleport, yeah, let's, let's teleport on you. So that gets us another copy of you. Damage. Destroy some of the infused cards, and because it's getting boosted based on the number of cultists we have, and we have a lot of cultists, that's pretty valuable. And we can do more infusion on our next turn. Wanted to do this on our second to last turn so we could still use these order abilities. So now we can, I mean, we can technically double infuse you. We could, uh, technically we could triple infuse you. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have three more spots in this row. So if we triple infuse you, and then use Royal Decree to play a card in this row, then we, technically, we're not going to have room to spawn in an extra copy of a card here, but both of our rows will be full. What would we create a copy of, or what would we play, rather? We'd like for it to be, uh, Bronze Cultist, ideally, and Thirsty Dame. If we're about to apply even more sasses, would be nice, but we'd like to do this first, so we can actually create all those copies in the first place, so maybe it's not going to be you, Maybe instead it's Manganel because we do still have Emir. I mean, it's a little late for that, but I suppose I think it is probably still the best burst. Oh, it's not enough damage. Excuse me. I could have sworn it was going to be enough damage. Well, get locked. Okay, well, they can reset their location, and that's going to give them a decent point slam here. Curious to see if that's going to be enough. But it's not! 
So we'll hold on for the 2-0 win. All right, Sukone up against Syndicate here. And they'll go first. Okay, so no scenario, but we do have Onero, so we can make it happen that way. Uh, one cultist in our starting hand, no gold cultist, which is actually two cultists in our starting hand, but they're both bronze. Then we got Kahir and Dodrick were the two additional cultists that we got in our starting deck, so we'd like to try to get some more gold cultists in hand here. So let's try two of Amir, which does synergize with Manganel, and the Thanid Turncoats. Maybe we drop Amnesty, though, and save them, and okay, I mean, more cultists, and we can use the Deacon to create additional cultists. But do we have enough yet? Uh, we still do not. We still do not. Okay. So we could... Could... Onero into something like... Either Doadric or... We have Snowdrop in hand? Oh, we do have Snowdrop in hand. Snowdrop might be able to help us make that happen. So, let's not rule it out just yet. Let's start with the Deacon. And we'll at least use that to make one of our golds in hand here, Occultus, so that we have a way to trigger the scenario. And deliberately not going to make it Snowdrop, because we're probably going to play Snowdrop before we play the scenario, and we're going to need to play those gold, gold Cultists after we play the scenario so that we can trigger the scenario. And they're uh, apparently going to go Bounty, it would seem. They can certainly take out this Deacon if they'd like, or the other Deacon if they'd like. We can create some more Cultists in our deck. Let's go. Yeah, <laughs> you can see, not very many options, because... Most of our cultists are already in our deck right now. Don't want to make it Letho, because he will transform and lose the cultist status. So now let's use Snowdrop, and let's see if we can draw into either another gold cultist or the scenario, and that way we can use Onero to get a gold cultist, and we don't need it for the scenario anymore. That's what we're looking for. And there is a gold cultist, so that's, I mean, there's a couple of cultists, so that's great. Let's, in that case, probably get rid of... Meganel's not an amazing option. And we'll try this as well. There's the scenario, and there's Letho, who's an interesting option. Let's dump you, and let's dump... Ooh, second one's actually kind of tough. We... I guess we'll dump Letho. I don't love it, but he's mostly there. So that we can transform into another version of a cultist. He won't have the cultist tag initially, so that means he won't get the boost from the scenario. But it does, at the very least, mean that he can still uh, trigger the boost on all the cultists. But that's probably best saved for either at the very end of round one, or maybe better still, end of round two slash three, whenever we're trying to push for our, our second win. So let's go with the scenario now. We could lock these guys if we really wanted to and destroy this guy, because clearly the bounties are about to come out. And they're going to, I would assume, I mean, this is an easy target. This is a not-so-difficult target either. A little surprised they're doing Pirate's Cove, though. I was not expecting to see bounty when I saw that. Okay, Uma's Curse. A little surprised by that, too. Because that's just a big dice roll. Okay, well, I mean, it does give them lock. I'm curious what they go for. They should do this. It looks like they are going to target the initiate. It was the right option. Yes, the snowdrops are technically still a little bit dangerous, but that was still the right choice because we could have played in, or used this order ability on any of these guys and followed up with Yennefer and immediately destroyed this guy and created a copy of it. So, all right, in that case, I mean, we definitely want to make sure that we trigger chapter one in this round. We're still in the lead, so it's not a huge concern just yet, but I'd like to do that soon. So, Yennefer probably is the right choice still, and she is a card we want to play early. Okay. Nice. So now that made all of our cultists get boosted by starting off one, Every time we play a cultist, and that number will go up. 
if we play Bronze Cultist specifically. Oh, Nero into Phoenix for carryover. I mean, it makes some sense. But it is still an odd deck. Still waiting for them to do something with these Executioners. They're giving us lots of time to mess with them. And we can perhaps finally do something about that. If we use Initiate here, we'd like to make sure that we still have some Cultists that we can use in subsequent rounds so that we get carryover from this scenario, which is why we're playing it in round one. But we do have a lot in our deck, so that's not bad. If we were to play another Gold Cultist, we could get a Deacon out here, and that would give us even more Cultists. We'd like to finish with that, though. I think we'd prefer to get one of you out first. Especially because that can get rid of one of these Executioners. And if they don't use this guy, then we're about to get rid of him here. Okay, so here's the thing. Yes, we can win on even. Would we like to play one more card, go down a card, but play the Prophet, and yeah, his deployability is useless because it's going to reset the lock card, or unlock the card at the end of the round, but it at least gives us a Deacon, which we can use to create even more of the... Oh, well, actually, first turn, it's going to create cultists out of cards in our hand, so we add a cultist in a mirror, but we lose a cultist in the prophet. And it's the order ability that creates cards, or uh, makes profits in our deck, and that's going to take a little bit of time. So, I, yeah, I think we probably just settle for the round one win here. Still a little bit odd. We did trigger the chapter one of the scenario, so that's still fine. Okay, so teleportation is here to replay one of our bronze cultists, likely this initiate. Uh, the one that we spawn in will notably not get that status to get boosted every time we play Cultus, so that's a good way to finish a round. But, do have some spy synergies here, and we have Emir that's just, well, he's not a Cultist. So, he has a nice backup plan, but at the moment he is largely a backup plan. So I think we'll still try to find other ways. I mean, we can get even more Cultus now with you. I suppose it's not a terrible thing. And we do have one throwaway card here, technically speaking, and we might do that with the turn cut. We actually didn't play Onero. Wow. Um, do we have any reason to use something in particular with Onero? If we're just trying to get a throwaway with Onero, just so that we can get some carryover value from, I mean, like, sort of a deacon creating more cultists, but on the other hand, it is one of our existing cultists, so we'd like to use it to uh, proc those boosts. Hmm. Yeah, I think we might just be going turncoat from hand here. Obviously, nothing to target on the deployability, but that's because we're pretty much planning for this to be our only card. I mean, we could have pushed for a 2-0, I suppose, but just wasn't feeling it for whatever reason. Think we can still fine-tune our hand a little bit more here. And we do like long rounds. Longer the round, the more time we have to boost up our cultists, so that does benefit us. So I think we probably do cut it here. And of course, that's all they need to win the round as well. Yeah, because now we get one more cultist with Dodric and a way to transform into a cultist with Letho. So he's a good finisher. We, we have tons of finishers with the double teleportation and Letho, so that's pretty insane. We'd like to get probably another bronze cultist here, if possible, like this deacon be our preferred option. Same um, is definitely not, not one of our better cards for this purpose. It is largely a counter for something that they are not doing. Okay, Wagenberg for armor. Also odd? Don't really know what to make of what they're doing here, but I suppose we will still proceed with our spies and, uh, well, we can still further fine-tune our hand with things like Doedric and, to a lesser extent, with Emir. Could potentially swap out this same -um. Probably will swap out this same -um. Like playing Emir early, it's just that we don't have that much in the way of synergies for him. Because he's not a cultist. And Thirsty Dame goes along with him, but we've kind of gotten rid of the other stuff. So we might start off with the Initiate here, I think, first.
try to get the cultists popping off as quickly as possible. Or Wagenbergs, tons of armor. What are they up to? This is weird. This is pretty weird. And the armor does make it harder, for what it's worth, for us to trigger the death blow on these guys. That is a little tricky. Granted, with the damage from Doedric, the three damage, plus the damage from him being a cultist on an infused card, we could probably destroy you. Is that a card we really want? I, we might wait. Might wait before we do that. What if we go Thirsty Dame next to set up Emir after that? Yeah, it means we're missing out a little bit on the boost here. Or rather, on the damage that we would have been getting from the deploy, but... Yeah, I think we'd rather target somebody like this. These guys are better options for us to go after. So, let's certainly go for you. And go for you. And now that we have the Thirsty Dames on the board, that means they're getting boosted when we give those statuses, and that's another reason why we have the Thirsty Dames, in addition to, of course, synergizing with Emir as well. So, now, why don't we... Hmm. Go to get Emir to give us more Thirsty Dame synergies. That's not a bad option. But he's not a cultist, which means we don't immediately destroy you. Prophet does and locks whatever they play next. We might go Prophet here, to be honest. It's a little bit early for it. But I think we'll do it. So I want to destroy you as quickly as possible. And yes, the longer we wait, the bigger the boost will be because we'll control more cultists, but... Oh, also, end the turn. This one will get a bigger boost when we destroy you, and so on and so forth. We have plenty more ways to get more of these initiates because that's likely what this teleportation is going to be for, and possibly Letho as well. Okay, old geared. Gets locked. At least the initial one gets locked. So we can damage him. Can't damage him. But you were gonna be the next target anyway. And so I think it's we could. Probably should go Emir now. Yeah, let's do it. Or or do we say Doedric might potentially swap him out. I mean, it's possible. It's possible. Onero is going to be... Might be a deacon, in which case we could transform or turn uh, Emir into a cultist, and then we're... That's the one hesitation I, I keep on having with him. So maybe that gives us a little bit of the best of both worlds. Yes, there are other good cards, of course, we could get with Onero, but the deacon is no joke. Okay, Witchfinder, here comes the bounty. Finally. We were waiting to see them use something like that. It just never came out. Oh, and that's... That's gonna be too slow. If this was gonna be your primary way of dealing damage to us, then at this point... I mean, let's make more cultists. It's not really gonna make a difference at this point, I don't think. Well, we could draw into them with Dodric. Now Dodric will absolutely destroy you. Because he has the three damage and is a cultist. So that's actually a lot of overkill damage, in truth. So we might now instead go for Emir. Dodric is not as time sensitive anymore. We do draw into a cultist, and I think we'll take that over the Samum. It does synergize with Emir as well. Uh, we do not have any spies to steal, but that might be something to consider in the future. We could lock and destroy you immediately, but I'd like to destroy you um, without locking you. Because if we do lock you, then we won't trigger the infused Deathwish ability. Could have locked the Witchfinders, but at the moment it's, you know, the bounties on this guy, and I don't think they'll be able to destroy him. I mean, they might use Graydon, I suppose, but... Alright, Surrender. Ooh, that's not bad. Ooh, that's actually... It's annoying that they did that. <laughs> because I was about to say... It's going to be perhaps the perfect turn 
to use teleportation on the initiate, the one power initiate, to create another copy of it, or to replay it, get it back onto its base power, and then create another copy, have another way to use infuse ability, but now that's no longer an option. So, does make the teleportation considerably more awkward. We could replay the Deacon, and it would boost our other cultists. We'd lose the infuse ability on that, so it's, it's not ideal. But since we have two teleportations, that might still be worth doing. I think what we'll do here is, uh, hmm. We should play a cultist first, because that's going to be enough to destroy you. Technically, probably should have given that spine to someone else, like we could have stolen the Witchfinder. We knew we were going to destroy that guy, but anyways. Anyways, that will do, I suppose. We could still have Letho. Yeah, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll have Letho transform into an initiate, and then we'll teleportation on the weakest Letho. We might be finishing with Deldrick, which is a little bit awkward, but so be it. Okay, so Nero into what? It's more damage. And a card that we can definitely target with some future initiates. So let us go after you, I think. Because we can. And then we will use Letho here to transform into another cultist, namely more initiates. That triggers the boost because he counts as a cultist. He does not have the infuse ability because he was not a cultist in our starting deck. And that's in large part why we hope to use teleportation on you specifically. Because we don't lose any uh, infuse ability and we increase the base power, we boost everyone again. So that's the hope. This can be a backup plan. We can use it on you if necessary. We're going to run a little bit low on board space here. So if anything, we might actually kind of like if they destroyed some of our weaker cards here. They're all providing some value. Suppose profit's not that useful to us. Yeah, and okay, this makes a lot more sense. The Wagenbergs with living armor. Surprised they didn't try to do that earlier. But now we can. I mean, we could damage and steal you. But as I was just saying, I think we care more about board space than that, and you might be the card that we infuse on as well. So, in fact, that is almost certainly the case here. So, we do this, and we do that, and then might as well. Oh, uh, actually, let's focus on you, because we have enough damage to take care of you, I think. Could also lock these guys. I think we will, come to think of it. Let's go, or... After we damage, we should lock. No, it's this. Replay you. Huh. It's a little bit strange that it didn't... Uh, thought it would have triggered our uh, boost there. So we did replay you. That is strange. I'm actually not sure if that's a bug. Igni. Which row? Um, melee is kind of better, because that Thirsty Dame was actually bigger, but certainly not enough to catch us yet. So now, I mean, we can do some more infusions here on cards that do not yet have infusions, and you can actually double down on infusions, and in doing so, give yourself uh, more damage and create additional copies if you do trigger that Death Wish on this card, so... Might opt to do that, because at 6 power, it's a little hard to remove. Then we can still... Hmm. And Dodrick gives us damage on you. Yes, we'll do this. Destroy you that way, get a huge boost on you. Then I suppose we'll use Dodrick, because... Uh, I don't think we want AMC, though. Tempted to... Well... Yeah, that is going to prevent this from... Oops. From creating a, a copy of you on our side. Also, a turn had ended. And so it decided to use our second leader ability charge. So yeah, you know, if we were patient, we probably still could have gotten the, the death blow there and not needed to destroy you. And they'll create another copy. But not a huge deal. Not a huge deal. See what we get with Dodrick, because we may, in truth, not actually want to use help. Portation. The Yurden is big. Oh, is quite big. It's still not big enough, though. 
even after the boost on those living armors. So we'll do some card swaps here. May want that that spores, but we have technically already won. So uh, for that reason, I mean, if we'd like, we can of course get some damage on the turncoats. We can swap another card if we'd really like to. Ideally, we might be looking for another cultist to guarantee that we boost all of our existing cultists here, but not necessary. Oh, except now that we've used Dodrick, we do actually need to do it. So, uh, um, yeah, but sorry, I guess that the DMs, DMs will, will proceed. There's, we'll go uh, Range Roka here. Range Roka here. He's a cultist, so he will still boost up, but obviously it's not really the place you're trying to play here, but we'll take the win. So there's a look at a Nilfgaard Cultist deck for the new Plus One Seasonal Event. If you liked the video, then make sure to hit the like and subscribe button and leave a comment down below. Let me know which other cards, archetypes, and factions you'd like us to experiment with next. Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you next time.